Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you um, to this evening's British Library event on the British Empire and the Chinese diaspora. I'm Lucien Lo. I'm a reader in English literature at the University of Liverpool, and I will be your chair for this evening. I'm also one of the external co-curators of the British Library exhibition, Chinese and British, which is currently at the British Library and it runs till the 23rd of April. It's free, so please visit if you're able to. And if you can't, the exhibition is also touring to over 30 regional libraries in different cities and towns across the country um, through the British Library's Living Knowledge Network, which is a network that connects libraries throughout the country to the BL's activities and events. We also have a series of online events such as this one and in-person events at the British Library site itself to accompany the exhibition Chinese and British. So please do try and attend some of those um, if you can. Um, I've just got a couple of housekeeping um, points for our audience. Um, we'll be taking questions later on. You can submit your questions for the panelists using the question box below the video. Uh, please use the tabs above the video to provide the British Library with feedback on the cultural events program and also to donate uh, to the library. This evening, it's my pleasure to be joined by three panelists, Yvonne Foley, Hannah Lowe, and Peng Wen Lun, who will each be speaking about their own personal histories that intertwine with wider collective histories where the reach of the British Empire intersects with the Chinese diaspora. But I think what's particularly interesting and fascinating about each of these, these histories that we'll learn about this evening is also the ways in which the process of understanding these histories are forged through the lens of identifying as Chinese within the seat of the ex-empire here in Britain itself. So it's a story about immigration uh, and, and the journeys that underpin those different journeys of immigration across spaces which we might not necessarily think about in the context of being Chinese in this country. So we'll be hearing about multiple layers of identification of being both Chinese and British and, and in between as well, routed through different family journeys of travel, um, some of which are inherited, they're intergenerational, sometimes they're traumatic. We'll hear about stories spanning across both colonial and ex-colonial spaces. So the historical scope of what we'll be learning about today, I think from our three speakers, will be quite expansive. And the different geographical regions um, are really diverse as well. We'll be hearing about stories from Jamaica, from India, from Singapore, from Shanghai, all um, testifying to the legacy of empire, not only in these far reaches um, of the imperial space, but in actually in Britain itself in the contemporary moment. From the perspective of a relatively underrepresented um, point of view in terms of the Chinese communities in Britain. So I guess unlike um, the South Asian or Caribbean communities in, in Britain, Chinese communities have a much less explicit connection to empire. So I'm delighted that we're holding this event um, this evening and we'll have the opportunity to learn about these kind of lesser known histories. Uh, to give you a quick outline of the format for this evening, I'll introduce each of our speakers in turn. They'll each speak for about eight to 10 minutes and then I'll chair a discussion between me, Yvonne, Hannah and Wen Lun for about 20 minutes. And I'll then open um, the floor up to questions and comments from you, the audience. So please do feel free uh, to send your questions and comments via the, um, the question box and I'll read them out. Um, and I'll remind you about this um, at some point as well. So we'll aim to finish about 8.45 this evening uh, and hopefully um, you have a, a, a very wonderful time with us. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our very first speaker, um, Yvonne Foley. Yvonne is the daughter of a Chinese seaman and an English mother. She and her husband, Charles, have researched the story of the Chinese seamen, like her father, who were forced to leave Britain after World War II. It's been a journey that has taken them some 20 years, and it still continues. Thanks so much for being with us here this evening, Yvonne. I uh, have a Shanghai father and an English mother. I never knew my father, unfortunately. Um, the reason he was in Liverpool, as it happened, was that he was working for the company called Alfred Holt & Co, which were the major shipping company in Liverpool, and they employed mostly Chinese seamen. They employed these men from Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Singapore. Uh, a lot of them were employed and did the run 
um, the Atlantic run and brought food to this country. Um, sadly, as I say, I didn't know him because um, he was one of the men that were forced to leave. There should be a picture on screen now of a ship that was used by Alfred Holton Co. And that ship uh, used to be known as the China Boat. Um, it was quite common, actually, when we first went to Hong Kong many years ago, I think back in 1975, we actually saw some that then they were called junks and they look, you know, very, very similar to that. And that's the sort of history of, of Alfred Holtz. Um, the men were forced to leave, as I said, after the Second World War. They um, mostly were sort of transported back to Singapore to Shanghai, Hong Kong. Some of them did jump ship, we're aware of. They um, had a long history with, with the country, with Liverpool in particular. Um, this sort of thing did happen after the First World War as well. So that was kind of a precursor to the Second World War. Um, I would say that when they went back, life wasn't good for them. And as we know, you know, we spread. I mean, they went back, as I said earlier, to Shanghai, Hong Kong, Singapore. And it was sort of, you know, it was all part of the British Empire, some official and some unofficial, so trading ports. Right, slide two is, should be a photograph of myself in Nanjing Road in Shanghai when we went there and to the National Archives in 2007 to view any papers that we could find that were there and gave us a story. And there we heard some awful stories about the men who could no longer get work on the ships, any ship out of China, because the situation was dire there for political reasons as well. So that gave us a good insight into the sort of life that they had to lead. Unfortunately, we didn't have lots of references with names and things, but we did know that the companies had tried to find some of the men when they went back. Our research has, as uh, Lucian said earlier, taken us about 20 years or more, and we still collect information. We recently were in, in Singapore and found out some extra information, which is rather good to add to perhaps another chapter in the book. Um, they went back to Shanghai and had problems getting more ships. Hong Kong was a different matter because they were still dealing, uh, although they, they, they were under Japanese occupation, their ports were still in use. Um, next slide is one of my mother and myself. My mother had three letters that I'm aware of, which she told me from my father in different parts. And one, I believe, was from Taiwan. He got out. And that was all the problems that they were facing. Sadly, my mother never saw my father again after he disappeared. And for all her life, the fact that she kept me was something that was positive in my my view, basically because a lot of the women either fostered their children out or had them adopted. And that was very sad for a lot. And we're still, I think a lot of them are still sort of questioning why. I mean, we all question why we hadn't heard from them until we were able to complete our research in Shanghai in particular it was interesting, is that they couldn't get information out. So, you know, a lot of us said, why didn't they try to contact us if they wanted us? Partly because they couldn't. They couldn't get information out. They couldn't write letters. Even the papers from the shipping company were having to be referenced sort of one, ten, nine, depending on how they came into the country. So it was a rather sad time for a lot of our mothers. Um, some of them had to work two or three jobs to keep us. They didn't get public assistance. If they were married to a Chinese or to any foreigner at the time, they were classed as aliens. So they were not entitled to public service, public finance, you know, unemployment, uh, subsidies, all. So it was an interesting situation that took place that wasn't, wasn't very good for most people. Um, it caused hardship. But as time's gone on, it's been recognised that it took place. It's also an interesting part of history in the fact that the Chinese in Liverpool is one of the oldest established Chinese communities in Europe. Um, but we've never made waves. It's You've got to get on with life, you've got to live, and they carry on, and that's what they do.
we're, we're so grateful that you're you're willing to share these these kind of memories these kind of intergenerational memories as well that that are that you're just speaking for a, a group of other children as well who kind of had to grow up under these these very difficult circumstances um so we're you know we're really grateful that you're sharing this with us um today um if i could possibly turn um to hannah um good evening hannah um so hannah lowe is our second speaker um she's a poet memoirist and academic her latest book the kids won the cost of poetry award and the cost of book of the year 2021 her first poetry collection chick won the michael murphy memorial award for best first collection her family memoir, Long Time No See, featured at Radio 4's Book of the Week. She's a reader in creative writing at Brunel University. Thanks so much for joining us this evening, Hannah. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, I think I've got some slides. Uh, and as I was listening to Yvonne, I was thinking about, um, yeah, like 20 years of research and how even recently Yvonne said you, she'd found out some... Um, new information which was going to you know perhaps um be a new chapter in a book and it made me think about how in my own research um I keep on finding out more and uh so it's been probably 20 years as well of sort of using my dad's life as a jumping off point to explore issues of migration legacies of the British Empire the Chinese uh, diaspora to the Caribbean in particular. Um, and then about five years ago, I came across this photograph of my father's, one of my father's many siblings, Nelsa. And it's kind of the, uh, the basis of a, of a book that I'm trying to write that is both about her and also about what it is to, to research. Um, if you could click onto the next slide, it just shows you I think it's the photo again. So this photograph, um, I'd never, I never met my um, aunt, and I knew very little about her. Um, but it really took my breath away, uh, not least because um, she looked so much like my father, and that look that I would probably recognise differently from other people um, really struck me as looking so Afro Chinese. In in Britain, my dad didn't look like anyone else. <laughs> But when I went to Jamaica, I realized there was a whole community of, of these uh, mixed multi-heritage um, people that had that, that Afro-Chinese uh, ancestry. So there's that. And there's also the fact that she appears to be dressed in some kind of Chinese fashion with the diagonal collar, um, diagonal fastening, the, the Mandarin collar um, standing up. And, and my father never really talked about his Chineseness. He always talked about himself as being Jamaican. So to see his aunt, photo was taken in Jamaica in 1965, to see my aunt, sorry. So obviously presenting as Chinese um, through a choice of dress was really fascinating to me. And so the photograph, um, I think in my bullet points, I it guess it offers a way of me thinking through um, the different waves of migration uh, to Jamaica from China. The first, as I'm sure people know, is directly linked to the, the British Empire's recruitment of indentured labourers post-abolition. Um, and it's followed by a second wave of migration at the beginning of the 20th century, which is when my grandfather um, from China arrived to Jamaica, and then a, a, a later third wave. Um, and I suppose the photograph also lets me think through a concept or a, a term that I've really like, which is the term um, that came from an academic called Sean Metzger about the Chinese Atlantic, which speaks as a way of kind of conceptualizing the movement of Chinese people across the Atlantic and beyond the Atlantic, you know. Um, and I think even now in Britain, I think so often, like all my life, in fact, when I've ever mentioned having the heritage that I have, I've often come across that question, what there are Chinese in Jamaica? Still now that, you know, that would happen. So that knowledge, that lack of knowledge, I think is always what I'm speaking to and trying to answer. Um, and the Chinese Atlantic help, helps me think about, you know, this these different waves of movement, these different kinds of movement. And then lastly, I suppose I think about women's experiences of migration because my um, my father, 
from the first place he went from Jamaica when he left Jamaica wasn't Britain. It was America. You know, it was before 1952 when America kind of made it much more tricky for um, people from Jamaica to come to come there. Um, and Nelsa also had lived for a time um, in the US. That's, that's one of the only things I know about her. Um, what I do know about her and another thing that compels me to write about her, and I've known this, I think, since I was a child, is that she took her own life um, when she was my age, her 40s, in her mid-40s. Um, and that's another reason I think I'm so engaged with this photograph at the minute. Um, I am going to have to speed up a bit because I, I could say quite a lot. But if you could show the next slide, that would be great. I wanted to um, just read you something from a notebook that my father wrote about his childhood. And again, it's about how research comes to you or information comes to you later. So long after my father died, he died when I was in my early 20s, I discovered this notebook that he'd kept about his childhood in Jamaica, growing up with his Chinese father in there. Uh, they had a shop. Um, and this is a, a passage about his father's romantic relationships and children. It might interested people. Over the years, I came to know many more half brothers and sisters. There was Zeta, who I only saw as a baby. Her mother was Linda Bloomfield, who was mentioned previously. Then there was Nelsa, whose mother I did not know. Gloria, of his first marriage. Then Ken, a brother from a lady called Phyllis, whose sister my father lived with for a time. More about this lady later. Well, I think you get the flavour of my... Grand, my Chinese grandfather had many relationships and many more children than are mentioned in here. In fact, he had so many children that two of them are named Ken. One was Ken, one was Ken. <laughs> so, but, and I sort of laugh about it, but what it also speaks to is something else I'm really interested in is the sexual relationships between, at the time my grandfather lived in Jamaica, between Chinese men because the women came later, it was a, a migratory movement mainly composed of men, the second wave, Chinese men who were economically prosperous in the Caribbean, by and large, and Afro-Caribbean women. Um, and that is definitely the circumstances of my father's birth. My dad's mum, who's Afro-Caribbean, was his father's maid. Um, and certainly, I think, in, having picked apart this statement, I, I also know that... Um, most of the other mothers mentioned are, are Af Afro-Caribbean. And I'm quite interested in that particular period of time and those relationships. Um, many of them weren't marriages. Um, maybe click on now. I wanted to say something, a little bit about why I think my father never identified as Chinese. And it's interesting to me that you've got the kind of, the public or the collective memory, uh, the migration, the trauma but in my father's case it was also this kind of great personal trauma in that his father was very very violent towards him um and he says here this this part of my life when he's talking about his childhood was a very miserable one because not only did I have to work in the shop from early morning till about eight in the evening but my dad on the slightest pretext used to give me the most severe beatings imaginable for the most trivial reasons and um, there's more to that but it is my sense that my dad never mentioned his father and didn't talk about being Chinese at all, it, it, that it might be linked to that personal story of, of trauma and abuse and hardship. Um, so that's why, again, the photograph of Nelsa is so interesting to me. Could we click on just one slide? Actually, you know, click on another one. We're not gonna have time for all that. That's a bit of backstory. Um, so having talked about my grandfather as being this sort of like quite a promiscuous man, basically having children wherever he lay his hat, he was also a violent uh, man. He was also a notorious gambler, which is why I think um, my family did not economically prosper in Jamaica. This photograph shows members of the Chinese Benevolent Community um, uh, Association in Jamaica and having done lots of work and had lots of contact with them what I know about the Chinese in the Caribbean is that by and large they were a, a prosperous very tight-knit um, religious uh, um, community and everyone kind of knows each other and there's a real kind of sense of connection back to China but it was very interesting to me in all my research no one could ever remember my grandfather and I think he sort of lived outside of that community 
in some way. And I suppose what I'm I'm really glad of that because I'm really worried with my the way I present my grandfather that he is a bit of a stereotype. Um, and so counter to that is is the is the CBA. Um, if we could have the next slide. Yeah, and so I just wanted to say a little something about migration patterns. Um, as I said, my dad went to America as part of the US farm laboring program in the Second World War. It's a history that hardly anyone knows about. But in terms of its relationship to the, the British Empire and, for example, the Windrush, the characterization of Windrush migrants of having never left the Caribbean and arriving quite innocently and not knowing the hardships that, that were to face them and, and having never been abroad. For many, many of them had already been to America, as my dad had. He'd lived in the States for four years. And it's a piece of history that I think gets sort of neglected. It gets omitted. It gets silenced. And Nelsa had also been to America and then returned to Jamaica. And I, I mentioned that to illustrate that women's experiences of migration are so often seen as being secondary or belated to men's. And in, this is a real case of, of some, someone's experience that, that wasn't. Um, okay, one more slide or a couple more maybe, and then I'll stop. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so just to talk about research, there's all the kind of research that you do when you go to archives and you read books and, and all of that stuff. But what I've found to be so useful is social media. So when I posted this photo on social media probably five years ago and talked about my interest in it, um, what happens is that my dad's sort of long lost cousin, uh, who I'm in touch with, but probably wouldn't have ever told me this stuff had I not put it on social media, told me, oh, yes, that's Lorna. She ran the Moby Dick restaurant, a famous nightclub where all the politicians went, all the journalists went. She cooked Chinese food. She she prepared folk remedies when people were ill. She told me so much information, and that was all over um, social media. So when I think about the kinds of research I do, I'm always aware that there's a kind of orthodox and, and the unorthodox as well. Um, and then I think that's probably my last slide now. We'll skip over. Oh, yeah, actually, no. Um, yeah, I suppose just one. No, the next one, actually, and then I'll, I'll finish. A couple of other things from my dad's notebook. He talks about his own migration to Britain. And one of the things I've been really sort of try to do in my research is talk about how the Windrush was not just a migration of Afro-Caribbean young men, which is how it's characterized. Um, but there were people um, that arrived as part of the Windrush migration to Britain that had Chinese ancestry and therefore perhaps part of a Chinese diaspora. There were also people from Guyana that had Indian ancestry, you know, and that, that period of migration is what made, way more diverse than um, I think is recognized at the moment. Um, and I know that when my dad sailed away to England, he says in this uh, notebook, that he'd got to know her as later as an adult. He didn't really know her as a child, but he says of his departure to England, my mother, Nelsa, my sister, and several other relatives came down to the boat to see me off. So there's the ship sailing out of the port in 1947. And I'll just finish with the final slide, which is just two pictures um, of my dad and Nelso. So you can see the look that I'm referring to that I recognize, but maybe perhaps other people don't. And I think that's really interesting in itself, like how we see ethnicity. So it's my dad in 19... Uh, 54 in Hampstead, where he lived, and Nelsa in Kingston, Jamaica in 1965. Okay, I'll finish there. I hope I didn't run over. That's great. Thanks so much, Hannah. That's wonderful. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, you, these photos are so, are so evocative of a certain period that we kind of, you know, from a Chinese perspective, also identify with Chineseness of a particular era, <laughs> um, you know the the wide collared shirt on your dad's slightly open <laughs> uh, <laughs> his chest, and then you know the kind of wonderfully coffered you know look of your of your aunt. You know I have memories of my own mother, you know looking somewhat similar as well in these very kind of studio Glamour. taken yeah, uh, yeah photos. So you know thank you so much for sharing them. Um, I think it's just really fascinating that, you know, both you and Yvonne have talked about these kind of crosshairs of empire as well, where, you know, the, the um, these kind of peripheral uh, minority histories 
like Windrush, which now have become kind of part of a national narrative, yet they they are actually not homogenous stories. The Windrush, you know, generation's not one homogenous group of people. And that's, you know, that's so important in the same way as the waves of Chinese migration, say in the 60s, um, is the dominant kind of minority history of the Chinese community. But actually, those minority histories are, are much more diverse and they go back much, much further um, and have actually, you know, legacies which are which are much, much um, older than we than we uh, assumed the, the history of the Chinese community in this country um, speak speak about. Um, OK, so our third speaker is um, Peng Wenlun. And uh, thanks so much for joining us this evening, uh, Wenlun. Wenlun was born in Calcutta in India, uh, which had a large and thriving Chinese community by the middle of the 20th century. But along with many others, her family was forced to leave as a result of the Sino-Indian border disputes of the 1960s. And I think Wenlun will say much more about that. Um, she now lives in London and works as a documentary filmmaker. An oral history film she made for the Meridian Society entitled The Chinese from Bengal. And I think we'll see a little bit from that work. Um, documents the life and work of the community in its heyday and the trauma of their subsequent persecution. Thanks so much for being with us this evening, Wenlun. Thanks very much, Lucien. Um, now, you, you're not going to see much of me during my presentation, but just a whole pile of visuals, and that will give you the historical context to our story. So starting from the first one, uh, from the mid-1800s, uh, mid droves of Southern Chinese came out of China to escape poverty brought about by drought and the general incompetence of dynastic rule. And, in the, um, and you'll notice that in the next slide, they moved east across the Pacific to San Francisco, uh, to the railroads to join the gold rush, southwest to Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, and west to Baira in Portuguese East Africa for the shipbuilding and railroad construction industries. So Calcutta was actually a staging point for this third route, but many decided to stay there. Reason being, next slide, Calcutta by the 1900s was a thriving port, a base for the East India Company. And from the next slide, Calcutta also served as the capital of British-held territories in India until uh, independence in 1911, um, and that's the Victoria Memorial in the suburbs, and hence its appeal for the Chinese. Next slide. My mother, my grandmother, uh, was one of those, and she was an intrepid traveller and adventurer and also matriarch of Chinatown in Calcutta. And she and my maternal grandfather set up shop at the entrance to Chinatown and was obviously the center of gossip. You know, they could find out everything about everybody, but they continued to trade in Baira as well. My mother was therefore born in Calcutta. My father found himself there en route to build the Burma road with the Chinese army and uh, hence me being there and of course my siblings. Um, in the next slide, you'll see that the Chinese came from three areas of China. The first was from the south, southwest Canton or Guangdong, um, and they specialized in carpentry. And the more successful ones went into sawmills and building contracting companies. In the next slide, uh, you'll see a group from Hakka, which was in East Canton. Um, and they excelled in leather goods, shoes and bags and tanneries. And these two trades were particularly important in Calcutta for the expats, uh, the expatriate British who worked in offices and therefore who needed the wooden furniture, who needed the leather shoes and so on. And there was also a third group who came from Hubei in central China. And these were dentists, self-taught mind. So you <laughs> put your life at peril if you were to get your tooth extracted. Um, and uh, by the 1950s, Calcutta had a substantial Chinatown of about 20,000 residents. They were, it was self-sufficient with its own temples, trades, clinics and schools. In the next slide, uh, you'll see um, the types of schools. Chinese schools for the more humble families set up by the Chinese themselves. My father being one of them, he was a headmaster of a, a local primary school. Or English um, schools very often run by, by the Catholic Church for the wealthier families. In the next slide, you'll see that further and higher education was also largely influenced by Britain, uh, as you can see from the certificates there, Pitman's and so on. Um, and the next slide, we 
essentially, you can see from the photos here, the mixture of uh, the mix of of um, ethnicities that we lived side by side and in harmony with the local Indians, um, Hindi, Chini, Bai, Bai, literally Indians and Chinese are brothers, was a phrase that was used all the time during that time, and it was a slogan coined in the nineteen in nineteen fifty four when Nehru went to China, and Zhou Enlai visited Calcutta to cement relations between the two countries. In the next slide, though. Uh, you'll learn that not long after these exchanges, tensions started to grow. And this was provoked by the fact that after Britain's withdrawal from Tibet, there was dispute between India and China as to who should, exert, who should exert control over it. And this led to disagreements over where the borderline between the two countries should be, and finally culminated in the Sino-Indian War of 1962. The next slide. Unfortunately, the Chinese in Calcutta and in India in general, were made to feel distinctly unwelcome and were encouraged to leave. And these were the measures that were taken for, uh, to begin with, a two mile radius of movement was imposed upon everybody. So that those who were, worked in the sawmills or the tanneries, which were typically out of town, could not go to work. Adults were forced to register as aliens, although many were actually born in Calcutta. People were seriously harassed and followed by the police. My father, for example, was constantly followed by the police, uh, by the secret police, although they weren't actually very secret because they made it known to him that they were following him just to put pressure on him to leave. There was also the dreaded midnight knock, which uh, signaled that a person would be taken off in the middle of the night and abandoned on the border, literally in their pajamas. You know, they didn't have the, the time to, the chance to even get changed. And I remember my father always saying that he would uh, hang his thick over, uh, winter overcoat next to the main door for fear that he might also be taken off in the middle of the night. Many were sent to concentration camp in Rajasthan for four to five years, and some even died there. Assets were seized and bank accounts were frozen. And so preparations were made to leave. But the problem was that many had no passports. Some had come over to India illegally. And, you know, travel in those days was pretty easy and you didn't really need travel documents. But in order to come to, to other countries or rather in order to leave India, you had to have travel papers. But Indian citizenship was denied to everyone. And it was only on the basis of a letter of refusal, which would be issued by the Indian government, that people could then take these letters to go to the British embassy or other, uh, other embassies to apply for a passport. Typical destinations were Canada, US, Britain, countries that needed qualified white collar workers to fill the gap following the end of World War II. And job opportunities were generally good because there was no language barrier since many people um, were able to speak fluent English and had British qualifications. Still, it was a harrowing experience for most. Businesses were forced to close. Families, just like ours, were split up and the community had been uprooted. And just to give you an indication of the kind of harrowing experience people underwent, I'd just like to play this very short excerpt from our oral history film. I know that in, 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 in the case of my brother Stephen, uh, he had to uh, apply to the British Embassy uh, to, to, uh, f to, 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 to come to this country. And the, the, the Embassy told them that because although uh, the, he was born uh, pre-independence, uh, uh, nevertheless he still had to uh, try and apply for a Indian passport because uh, the, the, uh, uh, it, uh, India was now independent, and so subsequently, I know in the case of my brother Stephen, he he had to get a letter. Uh, he had to apply to India for a passport uh, to come to uh, the UK, but uh, he was refused, uh, and based on that letter of refusal. Uh, to say that uh, he, he was not accepted or he didn't uh, cr uh, qualify to become an Indian citizen, uh, th then uh, based on that letter of rejection, uh, he, could, he, uh, he took that letter to the uh, British Embassy uh, 
and then the embassy uh, uh, gave him a letter of, I, th I think it was basically not a passport, uh, it was just a, 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 a little certificate of identity uh, so that uh, he could uh, travel uh, to, the, uh, to the UK. I remember going to the consulate um, to, to get these papers and, and there were long queues going all around the courtyard in the consulate of Chinese people wanting to leave uh, Calcutta and trying to get papers to go. Uh, because a lot of us were entitled to um, travel documents because we, were, we had been born during the time of the British occupation. We cannot produce birth certificate of my father because those papers were destroyed during the war. What so happened, I have two certificate from a British steamship company, p &O, which state it's a discharge certificate from my grandfather stating that my grandfather was born in Hong Kong, date so and so, so and so. So we took it to the British High Commission and said, basically, uh, here you are, three generations. Ah, uh, they says, all right, we think about it. And they give us a backup paper. The next thing I know, it says, when do you want to leave? I got, we got a shock. I says, I'm not prepared for this when they say uh, when I'm going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I held up this paper and for six months I said I don't want to leave right yet. I want to settle all the we have been in this country for nearly 50 years. Uh, so I says all right. Uh, I said, in six months' time, we'll leave. We packed our little bags with um, um, underwear, emergency money, any jewellery we had. But mainly, I, we, my father was focused on getting us out of the country because he felt that for us children, there would be no future. So a lot of time was spent at the British Consul trying to get papers for me to leave and join my mother and my two younger sisters in Hong Kong. My father wrote from London telling my mother, if possible, leave India altogether, you know. But mother said, we cannot leave, you know, you can't take out anything. He said, never mind, not important material things, you know, just get out person. You, you have two hands, you know, you can make money later on. We were not a rich family, so we did have money to take out but I do remember some families, they just burnt their money, you know, rather than leave it behind, they just burnt it in a bonfire when they left. Uh, but I didn't see it myself, I've just been told that that is what they did. Well, this is a piece of paper that my mother had to get from the Reserve Bank of India. Uh, all people had to get this clearance certificate before they could leave the country. And the date is 29th of July, 1963. And it says that the following particulars, your passport evidence to show that sale of proceeds of personal effects have been credited to your bank account. It just shows, it's a proof that she can leave the country not knowing, uh, not owing the bank any money. We were allowed by the Indian Revenue, three pound 10 shilling for each adult, and then for children half that and then your bank account just get frozen. You leave it behind. So that's all. How did you manage? Right? Well, that's it. Uh, we had to leave it. It's with my, my father said, leave everything. Just take that and go out, you see. Between six and nine months, myself, my fourth sister, and my youngest ninth brother, we left. The rest of the family came in drips and drafts. And the last one was Hong who left in 1964. So in a sense, the Leung family has been in India for 60, 50 years. We have nobody left there. Only two graves. <laughs>
you can see from that that it was a very traumatic experience for many people who felt that Calcutta was their home and were prepared to stay on, but could not. Thank you so much, Wenlan. Um, I think we're all very moved by that documentary and um, I'm so glad you were able to share um, excerpts of it with us this evening. Um, we're now going to turn to um, a, a discussion between um, us um, for about 15 minutes or so, but before we kind of open things up to our audience uh, watching this evening. So um, if it would be all right, I could start with a question um, that kind of speaks to all, all three um, of you, um, Hannah, Yvonne and Wenlan. And that, that's to do with, I think, what really struck me um, having heard all of your talks is, is this idea of Chineseness within your personal histories um, have been linked to being targets of persecution, racialized persecution specifically, mm -hmm. and, and violence and fear and displacement. Um, and I'm wondering how you kind of come to terms with that, um, being uh, of Chinese descent or yourselves you know what what how, how do you come to terms with the fact that the chineseness in you is linked to this this traumatic history um does it trouble you how how you you've all worked with with that in in one way or another um and i so i was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that um and and how you kind of have confronted it. And, and that's what's been so wonderfully generous this evening of you to kind of share that process of coming to coming to grips with, with your Chinese and, and it's and what it means historically. Um, so maybe we could turn back to, to it's a question for for all three of you. Um, maybe we could turn back to Yvonne and then go on to Hannah and then Wen Lan in the in the order that we kind of um got to know you a little bit this evening. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I either suffered or found it as traumatic as what Winlan and Hannah did, or perhaps Hannah's parents. Um, for me, it wasn't like that. I didn't. I grew up in a city that was full of every nationality under the sun because it was a seaport. Um, I didn't actually know officially till I was about eleven that I was actually part Chinese and part English. Um, I'd had some, you know, name calling when I was younger, but then again, everybody did, you know, like we had a girl who was red haired, so she was always carrot top and got called all kinds of names. So I didn't face this as much as obviously I feel perhaps others did. Um, and certainly within the group that I've worked with over the years, it's I think most of the men suffered more than the women did. Uh, and I think that was partly, again, depending on whether they were Cantonese or from the north, you know, Shanghai and elsewhere, because there was the statue was bigger. So those that were perhaps of Cantonese descent, mixed race, and they were shorter. And so if you like getting girls and things used to be, they considered that a bit of a problem. Um, for myself, I I think, yes, I faced it now and then. I think as a female, it was a little easier. Um, when Susie, you know, the world of Susie Wong came out, that sort of semi did us all a favor, I think. But then again, it depends on which way you looked at it. Um, in terms of racial prejudice, yes, it was there, but I think because my mum was such a strong personality that I didn't actually feel, I kind of just think it's your problem, not mine. In fact, it was more interesting in China when we lived, we've lived, fortunately lived in Hong Kong, spent time in and around China. The prejudice was there, you know, it was like, you're not really Chinese. And I said, well, what am I supposed to be? I'm I'm not, I'm actually English, I'm British, I brought up in England, I don't feel Chinese, except that I know I am part of my genetics is Chinese. So, I, you know, I think my, perhaps my feel is a, a bit less traumatic in some ways, but certainly the communities, um, Again, Liverpool was kind of unique in that realistically, 
uh, it was more a Eurasia town than it was a Chinese town. It wasn't really until the late 1950s, 1960s onward, that we had whole families come in to Liverpool because Hong Kong and the new territories opened up. Prior to that, women weren't allowed out of China, especially if they were in a village, you know, married to somebody, the seaman. They were sending money home. That money kept the villagers alive. Um, so there wasn't that same relationship. There were some, but not many. I mean, we, you know, during our research, we have only come across perhaps about five from the earlier generation um, that there was women there. But, you know, I have a friend to this day who is actually, she's at Harvard, and she has tried to trace her family and find out how her mother actually got to England. And now my friend is like close to our age in her six or close to my age in her mid, you know, early 70s. And she's researched an awful lot of of the history. She's traced her ancestry back for, you know, 500 years sort of thing, and then particular generation back into the village of, of, of uh, China. So I think it was a slightly different thing. I think had we all been full Chinese, then it would have been different. We'd have had a full Chinatown, full communities. But it isn't, as I say, until much later, although it was still called Chinatown because there were Chinese that owned grocery stores and sold to the seamen and that type of thing, that when the Depression took place, it got less. And then when in the war started, 20,000 men, again, young young on their own, not knowing when they could go back, met up with other young women and things like that. So the relationships developed, you know. An interesting thing was saying, Hannah was saying about the mix, what we found when we were looking through the research papers, there was comments like, how come they married these men? And one of the comments were, well, quite a lot of them were tall, dark and handsome, and they were clean, very clean. They didn't drink and they didn't beat up their wives after a booze up on a Saturday night. They fed their children. You know, and these were comments that made us laugh, but at the same time realising, you know, that they were actually quite true. So I don't think I faced the horrors perhaps as much as, as, as others, or perhaps that's my personality. Mm. Thanks so much, Yvonne. Um, Hannah, any, any thoughts about saying there is that interesting parallel about the idea of the Chinese man making the good husband, which I've heard in relation to Chinese seafarers in Britain. But I think there's an echo of that, of what was happening in the Caribbean at the time that, uh, you know, the second wave of Chinese migration and the relationships with the Afro-Caribbean population. One thing I didn't mention in my talk um, is in all these years of thinking about my grandfather's violence towards my father, I suspect that that was um, partly born out of um, a kind of racism because there was a, I've read from through histories and social science, social scientist accounts of that period of time. I mean, sort of like the 1920s and 1930s, these children were being born, these mixed heritage children, black Chinese, and in um, by the Afro-Caribbean population, they were called Chinese boy, Chinese girl. But by the pure Chinese, apparently some of the pure Chinese called them ship yitiam, which means 11 o'clock child, um, as in not quite 12 o'clock, not good enough, not pure. And my father was an 11 o'clock child, as were all of his siblings. And I've often wondered whether that the violence or the dislike my grandfather seemed to have for my father was was in that so there's a form of racism there and then put into the mix that they're already living in a horrible um racist pigmentocracy with the legacies of slavery um still a colonial outpost uh still yeah so it's a really complicated thing to to unpick as far as my own you know my i mean i look white i you know i i like people think I get, you know, I'm a Jamaican guy in Brixton. I lived in Brixton. I come down the stairs and he would always shout out Polish. Hey, Polish. So I remember once I turned around and said, what? No, Jamaican, actually. <laughs> My own, I've never faced any kind of, of racism um, based on the way that I look, but I think I've carried the trauma of my father my whole life. And 
as I've got older, I've come to understand um, concepts such as like the legacy burden. When you live, when you live with a traumatized person, how you might take that on in some way yourself. And I've definitely done that. My dad was so traumatized. He was a, you know, his childhood was full, full of um, what they call adverse childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. And that led him into, you know, a life of addiction. I mean, he's, he was a gambler. That's how he made, made his money. But when he wasn't making money playing poker, he was in the betting shop. He, he smoked 60 cigarettes a day. I mean, he he his whole life was dictated to what happened to him publicly and personally as a child in Jamaica. As, as a the man that I lived with, there was much older man he was in his 50s when he's had me was was silent um and out of that silence I you know the germ of me needing to speak was born and it's really been my life's work trying to work out what happened to him really and and then how it affected me and and how how you know with my own with my own child how how that may affect him as well so it's been a big thing um Lucien yeah and how I answer it I guess or how I try to solve it is through writing um still trying to trying to answer those questions ask the questions and then find the answers and Nelsa is is another question for me and it does seem like a kind of lifelong journey doesn't it I think trying to understand yourself and that I thought it was going to be like a couple, maybe one book, and now I'm probably in the the, the fifth book. On, on, <laughs> on so it does seem I've got something. I'm working something out still. Oh, thanks so much, Hannah. Um, when Lance, let's turn to you. Any any thoughts about? Yeah, the... I think that uh, whenever an ethnic minority presents itself out of the blue. Uh, you're always going to have some kind of racial conflict, aren't you? Name calling is is the least of it. There is actually discrimination in much greater forms. For example, um, you know, when uh, we first came to Britain, uh, I believe certainly the first uh, arrivals, when they tried to look for accommodation, um, speaking on the phone, uh, they'd be told, yes, there's a, there's a vacancy, but when they presented themselves and they were seen to be non-Caucasian, then obviously suddenly that vacancy was no more. So, you know, there is, as I say, always incidents like this. I suppose that with the Chinese, uh, we've always kept these feelings of discrimination and prejudice to ourselves. Um, because we don't voice our personal traumas uh, and whether or not that is the right attitude to voice them or not to voice them, I'm not sure. But the thing is that clearly because we're seen as the silent mi minority and we don't give any trouble, we're always perceived as being a safe community. But as I say, whether or not that is the right attitude amongst us for keeping quiet or by the larger majority for perceiving us in that way and behaving like that um, is, uh, of course, a completely different question. But um, it was interesting that uh, Yvonne mentioned the word alien in her little, little presentation. Um, and, you know, when you consider that back in India, the adults amongst the Chinese community were forced to register th themselves as aliens when actually many of them were born there. I mean, it's just beyond belief. Uh, you know, that that is discrimination to at the, at, the, at the very extreme. And but as I say, under times of stress and uh, conflict, these things do happen. Yeah, the, the mention of uh, the term alien as you know, um, something unhuman or most, you know, um, you know, unknowable, you know, in both Yvonne and, and your um presentation, Wenlan, really struck me as well. So that being Chinese or being associated with the Chinese in Yvonne's mother um mother's case and, and other women who had relationships with uh, Chinese men just really struck me as as a really kind of discourse of racial racialized vilification um well in a sense it's more than that because you're not even and um, you completely lose your identity don't yeah. you you know we use the word aliens to refer to extraterritorial <laughs> extra you know, terrestrial, terrestrial yeah. people yeah 
and you just lose all humanity then humanity yeah you're, you're but, beyond human you're <laughs> recognizable as a fellow human being yes yeah. sir, on. but that term alien was not just for chinese it was for any foreigner that was in england at the time because it was a war period so they had to report to the local police station and i mean right up until oh what would it be about 30 40 no for longer about 50 years or so ago uh but charles's friends at university there was a number of them that were uh indian and i think there was a another chap that might have been Polish but they had to register as alien students they were on student grants and they used to have to report about once a week after they'd done their uh, initial couple of years at university they were able to apply as a resident so they no longer needed it. and that's what happened to you know during the time of uh, my father being here, he was registered as an alien, along with a lot of others. And when we searched in the archives, it was very interesting because if the women married a Chinese, they were then, they took on his citizenship, which happened to every woman, if they, every woman in the UK at that time, if they married a non-British person, they became a, the nationality of the person that they married. And it was stated Oh, it didn't come out that after a year they could reapply for their citizenship back. Now, you, in our case in Liverpool, a lot of the women were just ordinary working class girls, some of them not particularly well educated. So they weren't aware of these political goings on. And we only found out because there was a lady whose parent was a lord somebody and she had married a Polish aircraft, uh, a Polish pilot and discovered when she wanted to go on holiday that she was an alien. <laughs> so she wasn't very happy and, and applied and her, her father was disgusted because he was in the military at the time and he actually sent letters of complaint to the government but it said well we can't make exception you know everybody uh, that's it um, but they the lady can apply a year later no, none of the ladies that I met knew anything about this. And what was interesting was the restriction that that term caused. It was the fact that you couldn't go on holiday. Like a lot of my friends said, we never went anywhere. We never even went across to the other side of the river. You know, did this like a, a used to be a, a said New Brighton used to be a fun fair place, but they couldn't do that. And that was because aliens weren't allowed. Like people ask us for photographs. We don't have them. Aliens were not allowed to have cameras and they had to give the cameras to the local police station. So we don't have pictures necessarily of when we grew up unless you were. And it was also terribly expensive. I mean, to own a camera and get films. So, yeah, so the term alien, we have to be careful how we sort of look at it, I suppose, in some ways. But yes, I think of alien as somebody from flying around. and <laughs> But again, you do have to do that in, in, in other parts of the world. You still, if you marry within, you still got to apply to take on that citizenship of your husband if you're going to and you 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 sort of have a label there as well so yeah yeah um i suppose the term you know aliens just an ultimate displacement from earth <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. not, not earth, as it were um i it's it's now um half past um Eight. Uh, and I just wanted to remind our audience that uh, please do um, send in questions or comments uh, via the question box below the video um, and we'd be very uh, pleased to hear from you. Um, but perhaps as, as a kind of wait for comments and questions to come in, um, I'm wondering if, um, yeah, um, you, uh, Hannah, Maybe you could say uh, could say a little bit more about kind of um, yeah the sense of um, the 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 journey that you've taken and that continues to fascinate you. I think what's been so interesting um, for all three of you is this desire to speak out to to kind of uncover these histories on behalf of I guess Chinese relatives. Um, who might not have spoken up about 
about their own histories you know so no i'm really the real the, the real uh the really resonant thing that when lana was speaking about the kind of chinese reticence right so for my parents it's a you, you mustn't kind of air your la dirty laundry in public that that phrase was very much uh part of you know my kind of growing up experience but d d are you conscious of that as a kind of chinese trait um hannah not being you know visibly say chinese yourself well, that's so interesting. And I tell you something else that's really made me think more about um, my own relationship to China. And I know it's a fraught science. It was, was doing a DNA test because when I did a DNA test, it turns out that my what European side is so mixed up. It's all like 5% of this, 5% of that. But the Chinese is 25%. And when I saw that on the DNA, I was like, so it's true. <laughs> like, that really is, you know, and that's re that is, has really kind of shaped my thinking it's really interesting to hear about I mean I'm aware of that trope of Chinese reticence and modern minority um stereotype and all of that stuff but I've never thought about my dad in in those terms and it's really in, and that's not because that's not tr necessarily true it's, it's something for me to really think about the way I thought about his silence is actually related to this the, tra the traumatized silence of the Windrush generation of which he was a part so so after his traumatic life in Jamaica, he then came to Britain um, in 1947. He he arrived quite early in that diaspora, but you know we all know what what the no blacks, no dogs, no Irish um, experience of that group of migrants, and and that group of migrants, the Caribbean migrants, they are kind of known as well of, of being quite silent in the face of their trauma. So that's the way I've seen it. Now I'm beginning to wonder: was my dad extra silent because of <laughs> Chineseness? <laughs> Yeah. One one of the um one of the kind of theoretical things that I've found really interesting and and because I do believe that good theory does reflect our own lives and experiences is um Marion Hirsch's work on what she calls post memory. Mm -hmm. And she says that she's writing about people, um the descendants of the Holocaust, and she says that it is sometimes the next generation after the traumatized generation, the silent generation, it is the next generation that feel not only the urge to speak, but to do imaginative reconstruction of that, you know, and she was talking about Art Spiegelman's book, Mouse, you know, which is about the Holocaust, but she said this is going to apply to any collective trauma. And I've often looked at my own need to speak through that lens, that the trauma of the Windrush generation. Um, so it's really interesting for me to be part of this tonight and to, and to kind of slightly reframe my thinking about um, my father's, yeah, potential Chinese reticence as well. Yeah, yeah. I know that his father never spoke to him because he's the first thing he says in his notebook, my father never spoke to me unless it was to issue a command in relation to the shop, which was our livelihood. So <laughs> he came from silence. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, yeah, I think, I think sort of, it's like when I, I started wanting to know about my father and what any of the family members knew now we grew up in the city and again we grew up or I grew up rather than a lot of my contemporaries where you know you didn't ask questions and the comment used to be don't ask any questions you'll be told no lies uh we had certain of our friends that were you know one had been put in an orphanage and brought home and every time he asked a question his mother would say don't hassle me I'll send you back and this type of thing so you switched off and then you reach a point where you don't ask a question you just accept situations and when I was asking my relatives I mean I never asked my mother this was a strange thing because I felt it was painful to her but also I never asked anybody else about it and then when I decided I was going to try, I still had two aunties that were alive and I phoned them up and the first response was, what do you want to know? That's all in the past. Don't bother about it. I mean, you know, everything's gone and what have you. And then the other one's response was, well, he was good with engines and he was tall and, you know, he was quite good looking and that was it. But that's in the past, you know. And I've asked oh, all the what those that I know and they all say the same thing not their children, as uh, you know, as Hannah was saying, not their children and not their grandchildren, but more their children. And that would be the most, the most contact I had on the website was the children of my generation saying, 
I'd like to find my granddad from a dad or this type of thing, or I'd like to know a little bit more about, you know, my heritage and that, that type. Whereas we just grew up accepting the status quo. <laughs> I think that a lot of that comes about from the fact that now uh, we have digital media, the technology is with us, social media. It makes it much easier, doesn't it, to trace people and to trace facts and histories. Um, whereas back uh, in the past, that was not, um, uh, it was, these things were just not accessible, not available to us. And also, uh, as Yvonne mentioned, I think with older generations, they want to just look forward, look to the next generation, see how their livelihoods can be improved and forget about the sufferings of the past, just move forward. Yes. Whereas now in the present day, we tend to sort of look backwards a little bit and see, well, where did we come from? Why are we here? What happened and what was the journey like? And so it's it's a sort of, you know, throwback. And that in itself, I think, is a very in, uh, interesting social phenomenon. Yeah. That's perhaps, perhaps, yeah sorry, I had a... Oh, sorry, I was going to say, perhaps you can only do that because you're not living in, in the trauma. You know, like my, my life is so comfortable compared to my father's. So I've got the luxury of, of thinking about roots and heritage and all that kind of stuff. Um, my dad, my dad would probably have. He, he would just never. He was trying to survive. Yes. To make money. Yes. To, uh, you know, get through the day. So I think it's also about your subject position as well as the digital. That has been key, huge thing yes. for me. Yeah. Um, I have a question from um someone watching, and I hope you don't mind. Um, so this is from Trevor, and it's a it's a really good segue actually from what we've been talking about because we've been really talking about the Chinese community's engagement with the British Empire of the past. But this question kind of pertains to the way in which um, China has kind of been viewed as the next empire almost, and what perhaps that, how that kind of affects, you know, the view of, of being Chinese. So um, this is Trevor's um, comment question. Um, there seems to be a new wave of migration to the West Indies Africa, etc. As Chinese businesses and, and government make inward investments, support construction projects, and so on, how do you think their experiences will be different in twenty twenty three and presumably um, in the future compared to the histories that you've shared with us this evening? Um, yes, <laughs> very <laughs> different question. Quite, yeah, quite when different. One, please do again. Uh, I would say that. Uh, um, our parents' generations were, at, at that time, China was an impoverished country. Uh, it was weak politically, financially, in every what way. Now, when you see China, it is a rising global power. And so when you get migration patterns around the world, they are no longer the underdog. And I think that's going to affect perceptions of them just as they perceive others when they travel. I think it's going to be very different. I'm not sure that it's going to be good, as it were. You know, I mean, you there's, there's never anything good when you have superior superiority and inferiority complexes and behaviors, but um, I think it's going to be certainly a very different experience. Thank you, Wenlan. Um, Hannah or Yvonne, would you? We, we were talking about this actually uh, in a meeting of, I was talking to some academic scholars of the Chinese Caribbean uh, this, last week, who were much more sort of embedded in Trinidad, Jamaica than, than I am. And they were saying that the new Chinese that are now in uh, say Jamaica, come from a completely different region. A lot of them come from, I think it's, if I'm pronouncing it right, it's Hunan or Hunan in, in China. And that, my my friend was saying there's some anxiety in the chi the older Chinese about what the next my, you know the next group how they will act how it will reflect back on them those kind of typical um, worries that happen when new migrant groups arrive even though they're from the same yes they're from the same country but they're coming in very different circumstances and um, as Wen Len says with a lot more uh, economic power um, as well so you know I think it's all to to kind of um, it will all play out, but already I'm aware that there's a tension between uh, what Jamaicans are calling the new Chinese as <laughs> compared to the old Chinese. 
Yeah, I think that's within each community. I mean, I know certainly within within Liverpool and elsewhere that I'm associated with, it's a big mixed bag of a situation whereby the older generation of which I'm now part of, but prior to myself, those were very apprehensive about our generation, our parents. Uh, my generation, we've spread out so much, the disperse, the level of Chinese within Chinatown is quite low. It's, it's, I think it's at an all time low in comparison to previous years. The new generation that have come in don't actually, again, depend on which part they come from. If they come from northern China as compared to southern China or the five counties, uh, the Ningbo associations and things like that, or the Sayip societies, there's conflict there. Um, there's the fact that some of them come in and they're quite wealthy. They like to show that wealth off. Doesn't go down very well with your average Joe who's been working very hard and just got your nice home and that somebody's showing off. So within the communities, there's actually some conflict going on. So for them coming in on a business level, that's a different kettle of fish altogether. And in some cases, yeah, there's the slight fiction. So it, it varies. I mean, the same with London, as, as Lucian would know, and some of the groups that have associated with there. The conflict is still there. It depends very much on the educational level of the background as to their approach and whether they do. Going, say, to the Hong Kong situation, I assist with the influx that we've got from there. They're different. They're kind of accepted as the underdog. So there's a, a support systems for them. What happens later, we don't know. It, it, it's still very much up in the wind as to how things will settle down. And it, again, depends on the numbers. Once you, If you flood, you have a problem. If you just put them in in drips and drabs, it makes life a lot easier for them and for the people around them. They don't feel threatened. And usually people retaliate if they're threatened, as we all know. So, yeah, it's very personal point of view, along with discussion with other people, yeah. Thank, thank you, Yvonne, um, and Wenlan and Han, Hannah. Um, I think we've kind of come to the end of the event now, um, but it's been in so interesting and fascinating to hear about these kind of relatively underrepresented histories and to also think that, you know, those histories could be so different from the histories of um, kind of future Chinese, um, the Chinese diaspora in, in, in Britain who would have a very different relationship to empire, um, you know, as Chinese, as, as the Chinese economy grows and, and is considered a kind of global um, economy of its, uh, of its own kind of weight and heft um, as well, you know, um, to replace the, the, the kind of erstwhile empire of, 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 of European uh, powers. So, um, it's it's been a you know fascinating moment I think to think back to that past and to think in this moment of 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 a, a, a different kind of construction of the Chinese diaspora in in Britain. Um, so thank you so much uh, again to 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 Wenlan, uh, Yvonne, and Hannah for joining us this evening. Also thank you so much to our, our online audience. Uh, for joining us. Um, I hope you have a very good rest of the evening. Uh, and just a reminder that um, please keep an eye on the what's on pages of Brit the British Library website for more events. Um, Chinese and British, the exhibition uh, that I've co-curated is open till the 23rd of April. Uh, please do uh, bring your friends and family. Uh, it's free. Um, and you can also watch past events um, that the British Library has held in conjunction with the exhibition on the British Library player. Um, so uh, I, I do uh, just want to thank everyone again uh, and our speakers, and I hope you all have a very good rest of your evening. Thanks so much. <laughs>